hundred percent. It's just to me, if if anyone asks me for career advice, it's the first thing that I ask them. Like, what do you not want to do? Because knowing what you don't want to do is so powerful. Because it creates, it allows you to create momentum. Because like, it doesn't matter that you're not like, just move. And if you if you know that the right thing to do is to move away um, from where you are now, or move you know, against the flow of the direction that you're going, like it's it's such a powerful starting point because it then the opportunities present themselves like in front of that. You're listening to another episode of Success with Purpose, where we hold conversations with the most holistically successful people we have the opportunity to connect with. We explore their journeys, their life-changing events, their perspectives, their mindset, and most importantly, their purpose. I'm Harry Goldberg, host, interviewer, and interrogator of this podcast, father of the most incredible daughter in the world, husband of an incredible woman, and director and empowerment coach at Purpose Advisory. Hope you enjoy this episode, and don't forget to subscribe and like below. Now, let's begin. Ben, great to have you here. Harry, great to be here. So let me give your let me give the listeners a little bit of a background of you. So you started out as an engineer in two thousand one at Lendlease, and then five years later, you decided to move across to becoming a finance manager. Moved your way up to national manager of project and accounting. Kept going down this finance route. You went to another big company uh, for as a finance director. You did your own consulting stint for about eight months, became second in command to CFO of Bill Corp. And then one year later, which I think was about two, two and a half years ago, you yep. became CFO at Bill Corp. And this whole time, which I've known you for a few years of it, uh, you've managed to build stronger and stronger connections with your wife and two daughters. I've seen how present you are with them. Personally, that's been a source of inspiration for me as a young dad. And you've clearly had a fruitful and rewarding journey with all its ups and downs. So... Off the back of all of that, how, which I definitely define as successful, how do you define success? Uh, firstly, I have to say thank you because that's a very complimentary synopsis <laughs> of a very long period of time. But for me, success is 100% about the journey and like not about the destination. I think if for me, success is living a little bit better every day, living, being happy, strong and healthy and living a life that makes me and my family and the people that I have the privilege to just touch and be around and work with and yeah, and have as part of my life is to try and make their life a little bit better every day as well. So I used to be like really attached to like achievements and outcomes and this is what I want to do and, and what I want to achieve. Uh, but for me now, it's 100% about just getting a little bit better every day. What does better mean? Like, I think as I get a little bit older, I get a little bit more, I get more and more self-reflective. And so I see the things that, I see the things when I have a good day and like everything goes well and I, and I sleep well and I eat well and I exercise and I meditate and, you know, I, I have quality time with my family and, and, and all of those things come together and I finish that day and I go, gee, that was good. And like, and all of the external variables have to align, all of the things out of my control have to align to allow that to happen. And when I have those days, which is very, very rarely, I, they're the ones that I aspire to, to replicate every day. And then I, then I just think about, well, how can I make that a little bit better if, the next time? So it's for, yeah. So better is, you know, it's almost like the perfect day. Although I, I always say to, to Lily and Grace, there's no such thing as perfect, so don't aspire to it. But I guess that, that's the contradiction that that we all live with. So how do you aspire to it if so much of it is external to you? Well, I just think there's a lot of external things that I can't control, and and again, the the I think the older you get the more you realize how little you can control. Um, and, and I think that part of that leads to then letting go of control as well. Um, so I think, yeah, that's my aspiration. Like that's, that's what I, that's what I define as getting better every day. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just a work in progress. 
Cool. I, I hear that's a work in progress. That's what I've always loved about you as well. Like it's, you've never said, man, I got it all worked out. It's, it's like this. You've never, I've never once heard you say that. Well, like anyone that says that, you just kind of like, I don't know, it just seems so disingenuous because you know that there's always something bubbling underneath. But I guess like the other thing that I think about, and COVID has really made me reflect on this even more, is that I think you really need to be prepared when shit gets heavy. Mm-hmm. And having that really basic, like underlying, ben- like benchmark almost or foundation of just like a really, like a really solid routine and and just you know that you know works, I think really makes you prepared when things are completely out of control. And for me, I think that's a big part of why, like, I like being under pressure because I feel like every other day I'm preparing for that one-off situation where I'm under pressure. So, so there seems to be this, uh, like a big duality in your life <laughs> of, I need to let go of control of things and just kind of accept things the way they are. And then every day is going to be better versus I need to make sure that I control as many of the controllables as possible. So it's most likely that the day is going to be great. And then that means that day I've gotten better. Spot on. How do you balance those two? I don't. I try and get comfortable with that duality or that uncomfortableness i think it's just like i think just accepting that like that's what it is um is so is just i think every human being struggles with it and i certainly struggle with it is just accepting that there's that duality of and look some days there's things that you can control and then other days that slips out of your control so yeah that's yeah it, it's i think it's a constant source of frustration but i think that's the frustration of living i guess being a dad being an employee being a you know being a friend being a colleague um it's just life (laughs) so i i I hear that but that's that doesn't sound congruent with the way you really live at least not the way that i've seen it in what way what do you mean well you're not always trying to control everything no almost maybe maybe it's because i've never seen you in a work setting Uh, it's always been more social or mentor type but it's never been trying to control everything it's always been no. just observing, seeing what's there, being very intellectual about a lot of things and assessing it and kind of taking note of it to know about it for next time and then adjusting your ways with whatever's new or whatever you've heard yeah, and then kind of adapting your life towards it. Yeah, and I guess that like what you've explained is you know, far better than I could have articulated, but like that's it. And like, when I say control, it's like how do you make those fine tuning adjustments every day you know, in response to all that external stimulus that can, you know, take you on that, take me on that journey of just getting a little bit better tomorrow. So and is like, that success? Yeah. Just kind of being, so yeah, hun- being better 100%. tomorrow than you were today? 100%, yeah. But I think for me, it's because like, you, know, you I, like I reflected on a little bit, it's probably a little bit bigger than just making me better every day because to me that seems a little bit selfish and i still do believe that you have to look after yourself before you can look after other people and and i think you and i we've probably spoken about this you have to love yourself before you can love other people as well mm-hmm. and that seems a little bit woo woo to some people but i just like think it's so true yeah it's just just getting a little bit better every day but also making the people around me that i love and care for making their life a little bit better and a little bit easier every day and like, geez, gosh, I slip up. <laughs> but, you know, that's the, that, that to me, the 100%, that's success. So we'll, we'll dive into that later. I've got, I've got a million questions to ask about uh-huh. it as well. So that'll be fun, a fun rabbit hole to go down. Uh, maybe do you want to share a little bit more about your journey? Obviously, I gave the higher level, but what was, what was the first step? You went through uni, you studied engineering, and you became an engineer. Yeah, so maybe like go back a step. So I grew up in a very, very small town in country New South Wales. I spent a, you know, my formative years, I guess, or you know, finishing high school in a small town of sort of 800 or 900 people and came to Sydney to go to university to study civil engineering. So that was a like a pretty big culture shock, a shock, as you can imagine. New friends at university introducing to me to this thing called a cappuccino that I'd never seen or heard of before. Um, and I was like very, you know, math, math, mathematics and physics and chemistry. I was very like, I was almost like anti-creative. And I, and I know that sounds a little bit funny, but I was just so 
so like objective in everything that I did. I loved everything with an answer, everything with a solution, you know, which is almost a complete contradiction to what we've just been talking about. Um, and so I started, I studied civil engineering, um, finished my degree, was really fortunate to get an undergraduate and then a graduate job with Lendlease as a you know, civil engineer sort of project manager, or yeah, what we call it, yeah, contract manager. Uh, and then probably work my way through that progressively over you know, a good five or six years. And then sort of got to a point where I realized that there were, I had some like, don't get me wrong, I had some amazing, incredible people that I worked with over that time. And that was so formative. And I'm so grateful that I was able to work and learn from those people. But I got to a point where I looked at the people above me and there was just no one that I wanted to be. There was no one that that I aspired to be, and that what, really what was unaspiring about them? Uh, divorced, working weekends, you know, stressed, you know, just you know, pick a seven deadly sin, and you know, someone's you know, they're all there, um, you know, issues with alcohol, issues with relationships, and just probably to a certain extent because it was construction, it just seemed it still seemed to me quite unprofessional. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, because like I still work for a construction company, but it was just, yeah, it just didn't feel like it was right for me. So, and I was again, really fortunate to be given the opportunity to pivot in my career, but still staying um, at Lendlease. Uh, and that led me to going to, yeah, some new opportunities in my work. I did um, a master's at UNSW in accounting and finance part-time or I guess, you know, nights and weekends and so forth. Um, and then ended up in a national uh, finance or accounting role in their Australian business. But why, why finance? Uh, it was, to me, it was an intersection. I was s essentially stuck between three streams of a business. So any business I think has got five, maybe now six streams. So there's finance, operations, legal, HR, IT. And I was really stuck between legal finance and operations in the roles that I was doing. And I sort of, you know, I spoke to a few people about it and I really ended up deciding that I had to pick a lane. <laughs> and, I, and sort of like the metaphor that I was using at the time in my mind was I did a lot of swimming growing up and I was like, I have to pick a lane. I've got to, I can't like <laughs> swim across the lane ropes. I've just got to pick one. Mm. And to me, the finance and accounting stream seemed, seemed more professional. It seems more intellectually stimulating. And it seemed like a better, you know, I was looking at people who were, who were succeeding in that stream. And there were people that I looked up to, people that I aspired to, and people that I was going, hey, yeah, like if I was doing that in 20 years time, I'd be really cool with that. So I ended up picking that swim lane. Yeah, then was fortunate enough to leave and go to another big um, multinational corporate and do a national finance role uh, for three years. Then I spent, I left that, did a really cool four month overseas holiday with the family, with Phoebe and the two girls before our youngest Grace turned two, and then came back and worked for myself for, for the best part of a year. And that was really eye opening as well, kind of running your own business and looking at work through a different lens. So like similar to your experience of what you've gone through. So that was really cool. And then, yeah, finishing now at Bill Corp, which um, yeah, I feel super privileged to be doing what I'm doing every day. Yeah. Okay. So there are so many steps which you took there and the, the interesting pattern, which I'm seeing is that you just, you looked around, you, you saw where you were and kind of like you're in a particular lane or you're going down the path. You know, like, if I keep going down this path, I'm going to end up there. Or these particular people are great examples of where I'm going to end up. Yeah. And I don't like it. Like if I keep going down this in another five, 10, 15, 20 years, that's not going to look good. That's not going to feel good. That's not where I want to be. And it's not so much that you knew what you wanted to be. You just knew what you didn't. hundred percent. It's just to me, if, if anyone asks me for career advice, it's the first thing that I ask them, like, what do you not want to do? Because knowing what you don't want to do is so powerful because it creates, it allows you to create momentum because like, it doesn't matter that you're not like, just move. And if you, if you know that the right thing to do is to move away um, from where you are now or move you know, against the flow of the direction that you're going, 
like it's it's such a powerful starting point because then the opportunities present themselves like in front of that. So I've always been like a really big advocate of that. And I don't know how I came upon it, but I was, I've also, I think it might've been some advice from my dad actually, which is quite strange because he doesn't often give good advice, but um, it was always make a decision and make your next move that creates more opportunities for you. Mm. Yeah. So just making positive steps in a direction that you know is going to open up more avenues for you in the future. I love this. I'm, I'm imagining a imagining the metaphor of driving down the road and seeing that there's an obstacle ahead of you and you don't want to hit it. Let's just say it's a pole, like the, curve, the road's curving and there's a pole ahead of you and you don't want to hit it. What most people do is they kind of just freeze and they're like, the pole, the pole, the pole, don't hit the pole, don't hit the pole, don't hit the pole, don't hit the pole, the pole, the pole, the pole, the pole, the pole, and crash. They smash right into it. Even though they could have easily dodged it, it's straight ahead of them, right? It's only that wide and there's so much space between them. And your approach is like, well, I don't want to go that way. I don't want the pole. I'm going to go somewhere else. But what's the other place? I don't know, but I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm I don't going care. to move. Like, and then, and like, and that's good metaphor. And then later in my career, and like maybe we'll go down this rabbit hole later, is that eventually I figured out that sometimes when I was going towards the pole, I was just moving away from it because I was afraid, but I was afraid for the wrong reasons. Like, you know, I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of looking silly. Uh, yeah. And so probably as my career went on a little bit more and you get to the pointy end and things probably get a little bit, a bit more competitive and serious, I had to realize that sometimes I actually had to keep going in the direction of the pole, but I still had to do something about it. Mm. If that makes sense. Cause you, you sort of have to make career decisions that I think sometimes I, that you can be quite afraid. I think I always had that underlying principle or set of values that I was making the decision for the right reason. And that started to give me confidence that I could kind of, I guess, move towards those things that I was a bit more afraid about. Does that make sense? It sounds like you're, you're defining that definition of fear versus courage. Courage doesn't yeah. mean you're not afraid. <laughs> courage means you're doing it in yes. spite of fear. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess it's developing courage which is something that I certainly don't, you know, on reflection, I don't feel like I had as much of when I was, you know, at, at the earlier stages of my career. Can you give some examples, like an example of when you didn't have it and an example of where you did? Oh, uh, look, I think just during my early stages of my career and even university, I think I just, I definitely took on things that I just knew I was comfortable in successfully completing, if that makes sense. Like I almost went through my whole high school, university, and even early career, literally not failing, like just not doing anything wrong. And it's not like, I know that sounds a little bit strange, but like, I really just did take almost the path of least resistance. So, you know, so whether it was like competing for a promotion or taking on a harder task or just doing something a bit more complicated that I probably you know, knew was like a stretch target and I could do it and it would get me you know, professional skills and acknowledgement, I just sort of would always just sit back and just, just get done what I needed to get done. But then I think as I say, as I sort of got a bit later in my career, I realized that that's not a pathway to, you know, a well-lived life. You know, at, at some point in time, you do have to take risks. And like you said, you have to have the courage to, to face the things that you're afraid of. Yeah. So, and that, I think, you know, changing jobs for me was a big thing because I worked at Landlease for for 13 or 14 years, going through the process of leaving Lendlease and then going to work you know, at another big multinational in a, in a more senior finance role was probably something that two or three years ago, I probably would have shirked at to a certain extent or found an excuse not to pursue or, or, not, or not to, not to garnish, you know, or not to, not to chase. And I think, yeah, you know, so developing that courage to, to chase it was a really big step for me. And, and I think it was made a lot easier because I had those principles underneath me. I knew what I was doing. I knew I was doing it for the right reason. And, you know, you start kind of, I guess, taking those leaps of faith a little bit more aggressively. So you, you mentioned this term of like you were just going through it as if it was a bad thing. You were going through it like never failing, going through uni, never failing, kind of starting up your career, never failing. And you feel like that was, uh, that was stopping you from having more success? I think it was limiting my potential, mm. if that makes sense. It was definitely creating a comfortable life, but I certainly look back at it and think 
I could have. It's easy to look back and go, oh, I could have done this or I could have done that. But I certainly feel like it was, I always say people gravitate towards the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. And that's not like a criticism. It's just the human human condition. And we just, that's, there's so much going on in the world. It's just too hard. You don't need to make your life harder than it already is. Uh, so I think for me, I'd probably just describe it as following the path of least resistance. Yeah, rather than seeking a little bit of friction and and challenging myself and and, you know, and moving towards things that I that I was afraid of. But why not just continue living a comfortable life? Why not continue down the path of least resistance? Like you said, oh, life's already challenging enough. It's just that it's that potential of that, like wondering if you could do more and wondering what if. And I think longer term, a, a life lived wondering what if. It's like it's hard to see that being a satisfying life. Like it's hard for me to like put myself, you know, hopefully let's say I'll make it to, to 80 or something. It's hard for me to put myself at 80 and then look back on that and think, well, I lived a comfortable life and, you know, I didn't push myself in all of these situations, but she's like, it was nice and easy. I just don't think I would reflect on that as being like a satisfying, you know, you only get one shot. You're only here once. I just, yeah, you know, I don't think I would find that a, on reflection, a satisfying life well lived now this is this is awesome to hear you say because i think this is really relevant to everyone who's listening most people who will be listening to this will be uh, my guess is sort of in their 20s 30s maybe early 40s and they're striving for more success they want to do more in their life but they want to do it purposefully and meaningfully and do it more holistically right they want to enjoy the journey they want to have all the achievement and they want to be have, able to have some positive impact on the world around them But what you just described, and what you just described, is this this idea of you've got to be able to enjoy your life and needs to be a life well lived. And then you've alluded to doing all these things which make life less enjoyable to live as a way to live a life well lived. How do you... I had, how do you make sense of that? Well, yeah, like I think it's back to the, the contradiction that we spoke about earlier. It's, yes. I think you have to just get comfortable with the, with that contradiction. I don't think there's just accept it. And, um, and I think a big part of it is because like, like there's nothing worse than taking that big leap or taking that big risk and it just going like catastrophically wrong. Right, which is like, yeah, that happens, and like, that's a completely feasible scenario in in you know, in a lot of people's predicaments and situations. But I think it's still better to to do that than to you know to do it with purpose and to to do it with intent and to give it your hundred ten percent and then to still fail. Like to me, I think again, probably going back to my my underlying philosophy, I guess, is it like it's. It's the journey, right? You, you learn from your failures and you take the lemons and you turn them into lemonade. I think that's probably maybe one of my superpowers that I try and embed in both um, both my girls is that like every failure has a success hidden somewhere underneath it. You've just got to find it. And if you can't find it, you're just not looking hard enough. And, you know, and you can get really esoteric on it when you start thinking about like, what about really difficult tragedies? Like what about if my daughter died or... Yeah, what if I was hit by a car and made a quadriplegic? Like, you know, seriously, like, you know, find the silver lining in that. I don't know. I, I'd like to think that if that happened to me, I'd still be able to, to do that. And if I couldn't, I think I'd just keep trying. And then that comes back to the whole external influence versus the action you're taking, right? Because the only, well, at least it sounds like what you're saying, is the only times you're really going to have regret is when you've taken action and then it's resulted in a way that you weren't expecting or you weren't hoping for. And that's usually going to be because of some sort of external circumstance. You go down a particular path, you try, you decide to change jobs because, Hey, you got to kind of get outside your comfort zone. You move to a, to a new role in a new company and you got a terrible manager and life's just shit and it feels terrible. And then you're going to be like, Oh man, I shouldn't have made that. It just, it's a complete blunder. It's crap. Yep. But that's all external, right? And what would have, I guess the question you're asking yourself is what would have happened if you had just stayed at the same place and done nothing yep. at all? And then if you think, so and exactly right. And if you, in that example, if you stayed at the same place where well, you've got nothing, you've learned nothing. And even if you, you've made a, a, 
you know, what you thought was the right decision and it turns out to be the wrong decision and you've worked at a different company and you, you've got a bad manager that treats you, you know, awfully. And to me, that's just more information to make a better decision next time. So, yeah, I think you, you probably touched on it. Though. I think the word is regret. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's a, if I think about it, I think that's a key part of it is that is the, the probably the things that I've regretted the most, and they can be like really small things, is that when you just do them and then you look on it and you're reflecting, you know you've done it for the wrong reasons. I think maybe that's, for me now, probably something that I that I think about more. You know, earlier on in my career, I think I probably regret not moving towards the things that I knew I should move towards, but I didn't because I was afraid. And I think now I'm more thinking about um, like that element of regret of not doing the things when you know it was the right thing to do or you did something you know, for the wrong reason. I think they're the, I think that's probably the difference between, you know, when I first, you know, I mean, I'm only in my early forties, but I'm still allowed to say it when I was younger. <laughs> you got enough uh, grades to show. I've got enough. Um, so I think that's probably the difference. You, you touched on something interesting there and I, I've, I found with almost all clients I've worked with, it's this challenge of what's the right thing to do versus what's the wrong thing to do. And it's whole right versus wrong. And you just mentioned it like three or four times through the last minute or two. And so how do you define that for yourself? Or how do you feel it or experience or intellectualize it? What is it for you? Like what the right and the wrong thing is? Yeah. For me now, like it's very much about intuition and instinct. I'm, I like to say, like, I'm an accountant, right? So I'm trained to be a professional skeptic. But I'm not a pessimist, but I'm, I'm definitely skeptical. So for me, let's, so let's talk about wrong, is when my intuition tells me something and I reflect on it and I listen to it and then I don't do something, for, like, for me, that's wrong. Like, I'll, I'll walk away. Yeah, so let's say I just hear someone speaking inappropriately to someone in an office or in a cafe or on a train or just just like a situation that you just know it's appropriate to to just lean into it and just you know just call out the behavior and and, and tone it down so to me the things that i regret or the things to say the things that are wrong is when i don't listen to that instinct or intuition intelligently um and then on the flip side, when it's right, is when you know, I listen to it, I get, I get skeptical about whether it's giving me the right information or signals, and then I lean into it if I'm comfortable. And then, you know, you know not always right, but 99% of the time, the situation, you know, it turns out that that was the right decision to make. So I think for me now, when I talk about right and wrong or think about right and wrong, I think about it more in that context. And you can think about it like from a relationship perspective with your you know, with your wife or, you know, like, you know, you know, if you've done something right or something wrong, like it only takes, you only need to spend 30 seconds or 10 seconds reflecting on it to know, you know, whether you've been a dick or not. It's pretty, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's pretty obvious. There's definitely this tone that you're talking about of being honest with yourself rather than lying to yourself and fooling yourself. But like, that's the easiest thing to do, isn't it? To fool yourself. <laughs> Like it's yeah, the best thing it's, it's that we're good easy. with. We're so good at tricking ourselves. So and I'm like I'm really good at it too. Like I'm my no Dalai Lama or anything, but I just I guess that's again I'm just skeptical of the tricks that my mind plays on me. So um, what does that intuition feel like? It's like I you're saying what does it feel like? Like it's yep. in, it's literally in my stomach. It's almost always in my stomach. And what's the flavor of it? How does how does it feel? Just a, it's just a, a tingling, a churning. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting very esoteric here, Harry. We are, okay? but you just said your intuition guides you. I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to understand. No, no, what... no, like it's literally a physical physical feeling. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, you know, what is is it? I think it's just a culmination of a whole series of subtle variables that I'm probably picking up consciously and subconsciously, mm-hmm. and they all kind of. Yeah, you know, all of that information connects to a memory that I've had in the past, let's say, and then that 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 results in you know this processing past information and using it to to make another decision. So, 
So you're using these to you use your gut and your intuition to decide what is the right versus wrong decision to make or what's the right versus wrong action. Then you choose okay. an action and you made that decision to take that action as well, take the action you've chosen. Yep. And then your success is just a culmination of all those taking the right action. Yep. And it's not a it's a common right action. Well, and that it's not it's not even a not even that. It's even simpler. It's just even if you get it wrong, just learning from that and then try and make a better one tomorrow. And for me, I just think there's you can get so hung up on what you want to achieve or what you want to do. It, like it sort of doesn't matter what you achieve. Like just say, like when you recorded your first first pod, podcast, you'd be like, "Oh, heck was that? I, I recorded my first podcast." But then instantly your mind goes, "Yeah, so what? What's next?" Like. So I don't think it matters whether it's doing your first podcast or, you know, getting your first job or running a marathon or climbing Mount Everest. I still think there's that element of like, yeah, so what? Like you see world swimming championships who've won like 15 gold medals and two years later they're in the seven depths of hell, like on you know, dealing drugs or something. Do you know what I mean? Like I just, I just don't think there's value in – um in hanging on too tightly to those, those goals. I think a life well lived is, is more about how you live it rather than where you get to. That's an amazing point because of something which is really common in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example, is a lot of people will get to blue belt. They're working their ass off in white belts, usually a year or with COVID two years until you eventually get there. And then a lot of people, they get their blue belt and after a month or so, they end up just disappearing and not showing up to class and not training anymore and not wanting to do any comps because they just see that it's such a tough road ahead of them to get to purple. It's mm. all this work. It's all this effort that's going to have to go into it. And so they kind of just disappear after they've gotten into that because they're like, oh, this is going to be too much work. Like I've got it. Great. Awesome. I'm so excited. I got it. I got through all the injuries. I did everything to get there. And it's like, man, there's all of this all this extra road to go down, like all this extra kind of hill or mountain to climb. Maybe this, you know, maybe, maybe there's, maybe that's just not for me. Maybe I'll do something else. Uh, I mean, even like you can take the, the analogy of like, for me, like marathon running. So like I was really set, did heaps of training, finished marathon. I was like, Oh, that was great. Now I can relax and I can eat what I want. I can drink what I want. And like, you know, two months later, you're like, Oh geez, that was pretty useless. Cause now I'm back to where I was 16 weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and I think, and, and I think even like from a professional perspective, you see people make it get to a, a certain point or get to an achievement and they almost like self-sabotage themselves because they've got to where they want to be. And then you see the foot come off the pedal. And, you know, to me, like whenever you hit a milestone, or hit or achievement, it should just be another reason to put your foot down a little bit harder. Mm. And I think, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect at that, right. You know, cause we all, we're all human. But I do think having a philosophy of, you know, not getting too attached to the goals that you achieve is, for me, just serves me better. Like, I just feel like I live a happier life when I'm not as attached to the things that I'm, the goals that I set myself. So some people listening might be wondering, if you're not attached to it, why do you move towards it? Oh, no, like, I, you, you try, like you try your ass off to get it right, but you just like, you know, so like I, you work for, I work ferociously to get to the goals that I want to achieve. I just don't hang on to them as tightly as I used to because I find like you have to set yourself goals because you've got, I think it's so important to know where you want to go to. But on the, like on the flip side to this as well, it's so important, just, it's just so important not to get attached to your goals because if your life changes or your situation changes or your needs change, like you've got to be able to pivot and let go of it and move on to something else. And that's really tricky because what's the difference between doing that and just quitting because it got too hard? It's a really fine line, but that's where I think you've just got to be so careful not to trick yourself. But yeah, I just think holding onto goals tightly just doesn't serve me. Like I think it serves some people. It just does never seem to work for me. It sounds like that's twofold, right? The one is you don't hold on to it as the be all or end all that you end up there. Like you don't have to necessarily end up achieving that particular goal because that allows you some more flexibility. You're going to work your ass off to get there. And because you're working your ass off to get there and you're not holding onto it too tightly, you're more likely to get there. But then yeah. on top of that, you're more likely to say, cool, I got there. Let's keep moving forward. What's the next mm. goal? And I think it also like, 
allows you not to get to, as you approach a goal or an achievement or a, a milestone, it allows you to to look past it a bit easier and and see kind of what's next. And I think from a professional perspective, like, I mean, now I'm talking about like, you know, for, I guess from an accounting and you know, professional perspective, like, I think it's just really important to know, to have a bit of a vision for where you want to go, what you, where your next step is and where your next step is, because it really allows you to focus on your day-to-day jobs and your day-to-day tasks. And like, I guess you'd call them like your, your stretch targets, let's say, or the things that you you want to kind kind of smash out of the park. It allows you to put your energy into the things that are going to serve you in those next periods. And then when you're, when you've got purpose like that, it just, it just makes it easy to grind it out. Like when you've got, when you're doing something that you know is going to serve you or you think is going to serve you in the future, it's so easy to do the late nights and the early mornings and the and the hard yards because it, there's a purpose to it. And so that's purpose to individual tasks as in how those tasks contribute to the greater Yeah, goal. how those tasks create, yeah, how those tasks contribute to that greater, yeah, to that greater goal or the, or the goal that you've set yourself or the direction that you that you've pointed yourself in. So how many of these, it sounds like in your mind, you've got all these micro goals and you kind of like place them on a map of checkpoints in order to get to the ultimate goal. <laughs> Just and, a chart. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you charted it all out. You got it there. I'm imagining going up a mountain, but yeah. I and like, and the dots, the dots kind of just, they jump up and down over the straight line, but they, they're all pointing in, the, they're all pointing in the same direction. How many steps ahead do you plan in general? I think... I know it hasn't really changed. I tend to look at things as like at a 10 year interval and like I've sort of read a lot of books and heard a lot of people talking about like having 120 year plans and, you know, what will my great, great grandchildren be? But I, I can't get there. To me, it's like, it's 10 years. Where where would I like to be in 10 years time? And then after that, it's a little bit, I like it's a bit flexible. Maybe it's you know, five years after that, maybe I'd like to be doing this or 10 years after that, maybe I'd like to be doing that. But typically when I'm drawing the dots on that, it, it's literally what I do. You're just drawing dots on, on a chart. It, it's it's about a 10-year time frame. It's just what works for me. So there's the 10-year target you're going for, and that's pretty much like we're talking about a chart and a map. Uh, you're going on a holiday. And you're like, well, these are the places I want to see. Everything else is kind of, like, you know, approximate and all... This is, I'll go wherever I'm going to go as long as I definitely get to that. Like, I really want to visit that city and I want to visit that city. And there are a whole bunch of little places in between I could visit, but they're all kind of on the way towards that. Yeah. And you just, you know, you pop your head in and out of the areas that, you, that you're interested along the way or that, that you get, that you gravitate towards. But yeah, it's a really good metaphor. I say that there's no specific decisions or pathway that I, that I track or like when I'm mentoring people particularly in like in their careers, like I really encourage people just to put that flag on the hill of where they'd like to be, make sure that they've got the right reasons for setting that flag on the hill and then getting really comfortable with just moving towards it and taking the opportunities that get presented in front of them. Because from, like, from a work perspective, like you can't just come to work and just do whatever you want to do to progress your career. Because you're there to work for, for someone, right? Yeah. You know, for me, at the moment, I'm working for a private company, so I'm here to work for the shareholders. You know, to a certain extent, you're working for yourself, but you're still working for the purpose of serving you know, the people that you, that you spend your time with and that, that seek to spend time with you. I'm working towards the mission. Yeah. Um, so I think when you're in a professional environment, I just think you have to be flexible because you've just got to take the opportunities that present that present themselves in the context of your work environment. You know, so if you're working, like, I'm, again, I'm an accountant, so if you, I don't know, if you've got a tax audit, you know, you've got to take the opportunity to expand, expand your knowledge of tax law and taxation rulings and what have you. And if you're doing a system implementation and technology, then you've got to lean into those lean into that in a way that you know helps you do your job and helps the company but as well as that grows your own career and helps your own progression so and that's why i think like the dots or the the places that you visit you just i don't think you can predefine them because like the pathway 
there's so many variables that that come into play like what your boss wants to do what your boss's boss wants to do like all of those things you, know, you as much as you'd like to think that you do you just don't have control over them so but if you've got that flag on the hill about what you want to know where you think you want to go i think it's easier to to get the most out of those situations it, this is this is really interesting to me because as i'm listening to it you're a lot of people, when they end up in those types of situations, and they're thinking, oh, man, no, I'm being forced to do this. I'm being forced to do that. I don't have enough time for the things which I want to do. I'm working super long hours and late nights, and my direct reports are crap. My manager is terrible. My Everyone's just kind of pulling me in all different directions. I can't even do the proper work which I'm supposed to do to get done, let alone work on the projects and the other things which I want to do in order to move me closer to my goals. Yeah. And a lot of people see that as a challenge, as an obstacle, as a burden. Like it's, it's like, oh man, or maybe I can't get to my flag on the hill. And the way you're talking about it and describing it is as if it's an opportunity. Like, cool. You've got to find it. Yeah. You've got to hunt for the opportunity and find it like within the situation. And like, I'm not saying that every situation has an opportunity because I've advised plenty of people, people to just leave their jobs because their manager's crap or their, you know, it's like, it's, yeah, there's just no opportunity. Was but... that not the opportunity within it? Well, yeah, it like part of that and move and... forces them to do a resume, forces them to go and you know speak to people about where they want to work next. So even like in that instance, there's still there's still opportunity even in that decision. But I think yeah, like you're spot on. You just have to you just got to if you've got that flag on the hill and you know you've got a direction that you're going to, it just to me it just makes it easier to identify them. Because it's so easy to get lost in the, like, just like you described, it's so easy to get lost in the, I can't do my job and I've got 800 emails and my boss is texting me at 10 o'clock at night and I hate my job and I'm working on the weekend and, like, it's so easy to get stuck down that rabbit hole and, like, we all do it. Uh, you know, I certainly have done it plenty of times. So, yeah, if you, if you can keep in mind the direction that you're going, if you're pointed in the right direction, it just gives you at least a chance to, <laughs> to do that. So, so you've mentioned uh, you mentioned when you're mentoring people, you're helping them kind of keep their eye on eye on the prize, right? That flag on the hill, and keep moving towards it. Yep. At what stage can someone decide? You know what? That flag on the hill is not the right flag anymore. I've got to move to another one. Any time. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> but I mean, people can people can take that advice and then get stuck in a in another pattern, and they can go well. Oh, there are too many things going on. Maybe I should just quit my job. You know what? No, that flag's not right. My flag should just be quitting my job. There you go. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, I, I think I do acknowledge that. I think, I mean, when I'm, if I'm mentoring people or I guess trying to help them through that conversation, I'll spend, you know, I, I could spend seven or eight meetings just on their why of like why their flag is where they, where they want it to be. Right. And it takes a long time for some people to actually have the courage to be vulnerable enough to say, oh, that's, you know, that's my why. Yeah. So, you know, I want to be a successful CFO or why. So I can, you know, make enough money to support my family. Oh, why? Uh, because, you know, my father was able to do that for me. So I think I should do that for my family. Oh, Why? Uh, because my father died when I was 12, uh, but he left enough money for my mother to look after us. And I don't want to leave my children or future children exposed in a vulnerable situation like that if I die early. Right? <laughs> like, which is like, is that, super is that you? Are you, are you no, 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 no. That's, yeah. that's a bona fide conversation I had with, uh, with someone that I yeah, mentored years ago. Right. Um, so that's a super heavy, super heavy conversation to have with someone, right? <laughs> but but I think once you have it, then you, the flag on the hill becomes a bit more, a bit stickier. So I think you've got to do it authentically. I think you're right. You can't just pop it up and go, yeah, shit, that's just what I want to do. You got to, I think you you got to put the work in to to be clear on to be clear on that. So clearly your why has changed, or maybe earlier on you just didn't have the why, right? Because it's like <laughs> achievement and you weren't really clear on what that why was. I think it's a very good interpretation. Yeah, I'd agree with that wholeheartedly. What's your why now? I think I kind of went back to it is, yeah, you know, I used to have goals of like, oh, I want to be a CFO and I want to make this amount of money and I want to do all these sorts of things. Um, 
but now it's you know to me it's really about how do i demonstrate through my actions you know particularly to my family and my two kids about what a life well lived and yeah that sounds a little bit woo woo as well but i think that's what gets me up and gets me going every day whether it's exercising to stay healthy um going to work to demonstrate the importance and the value that i place in just hard work because i think there's i think there's a lot of value in just what's the saying chop wood and carry water i think there's haven't, haven't heard that saying before there's a, there's, but yeah i think there's i think it's like it's a buddhist saying or something but it's just like there's so much gold in just learning how to chop wood and carry water mm. just learning the discipline of hard work and perseverance is really important so they're the things that they're my why now of living a living a life and demonstrating to my kids and my to, and to my family and the people that I love that that they're the things that you need to do to live a, a life of being happy strong and healthy so again it sounds very like journey orientated but I think that's just where my head is at the moment so what are all the things that you're doing now to be the best example of a life well lived to your kids oh uh, the, the best I think the best thing I ever figured out was that to, to remind my kids every day to not to do what I do, not what I say. <laughs> because it's, just, it's, it's almost like extreme accountability. Yeah. So I would just like, I'd recommend anyone with kids just to, just to, to get your kids to hold up a mirror to you every single day. Cause gee, they're good at it. <laughs> Can you give a specific example? Of... Uh, just like, you know, get off the screen. You know, oh yeah. But dad, you're on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you, oh yeah, I've got yeah, I've got this very important work email, and oh, I've got this. Very, like, no, you don't. Like, put your phone down. Like, <laughs> so just like a really simple example like that, or like you know, or you know, just you know, try. I've got two girls who love reading, right? And I'm always like, oh, you should get outside. Let's go to the park. Let's go and walk the dog. And they're like, you know, and but they like, oh, yeah, no, whatever. Like, yeah, they're enjoying reading their book or whatever, and that's great, but they're not going to get a love for the outdoors unless I show them a love of the outdoors. So I just think it's just those really little things of, um, of just holding yourself accountable every day to, so that they can do what you do, not, not, not do, do what you say. I love that. As I do, not as I say, it's the complete <laughs> opposite of every, <laughs> of every example of parenting you can find. But it's so freaky because you realize like how many contradictions you walk around with. And then, and it makes you, especially, you know, my eldest is nine. Like it realizes how incongruent you can be. Yeah. You know, like I was saying before, it's, it's so easy to trick yourself into thinking that you're doing all the right things. And, it, and there's, um, yeah, there's no one more honest. I don't think about how you're behaving than your kids. They're just brutal. You'll find that out. Uh, yeah, I think I'm starting to find it out already, but she's only two, but man, if this keeps going at this rate, I've, I've got a serious accountability partner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess that's what you call it, isn't it? It's like basically breeding your own accountability partners. Um, there, there are two things which I'm reminded of. The one is, uh, imagining the story of seeing, a seeing your parents throw their parents into nursing homes to just kind of like discard them and only visiting once a week and not really paying attention to them. Yeah. And then they get surprised when their kids do the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. and then on perhaps a lighter note, I remember a comic, which I saw, I just loved it. It's, it's stuck with me. There's, there's, uh, two sets of a mother and child. And the one mother is on, is on her phone while the child is on an iPad and the other mother is reading a book. Well, her child is reading a book yeah. and the mum says to the other side, oh my God, how do you get him to do so much reading? I've been trying to get my child to read for ages <laughs> and they just refuse. It's, I think it's just really important. And, and again, like, it's not like I'm perfect at it. And there's lots of things that, you know, I think Phoebe, like my wife is just awesome at and you know, that she, you know, that she demonstrates through what she does every day you know, other values and behaviors that I think are as equally as important. But I just think having that lens of just, yeah, making sure that you're trying to remind yourself every day to, to that your kids are going to do what you do. They're not going to do what you say. That's, a, that's an incredible lens because I'd imagine 
that would flow over into your role as a leader as well in career. It does. Yeah, it does help. It does help me be more mindful at work of my influence and effect on people. Yeah, whether it's right or wrong, I think the more senior your leadership role, the more more amplified your behaviours are. And I think, yeah, I think, like I've never really thought about it, but it's it's very intuitive. It does. It has helped me a lot at work. Be more conscious that that people are paying a lot of attention to what I'm saying and what I'm doing, and that it's really important for me to be present and mindful. Yeah, in, in any professional setting, whether it's with people that I work with or whether it's with you know, stakeholders or clients, it feels like a lot of responsibility. But I certainly feel like being a parent has helped me become aware of that and then get a little bit better at it. So parenting is making you a better leader at work and being a, being a leader at work is making you a better parent at the same time. I think so. I think it's probably more of the... The former, though, I think not so much the latter. Yeah. And I'm not saying you can't be a great leader at work if you're not a parent. It's because it's just not true. And I know that it's not true because I've seen phenomenal leaders who aren't parents. But I just think for me, it's made a big difference. So you've got your why in the distance, which, which you gave some clarity towards as well. But you've got all these different parts of your life which are contributing towards it. There's what you're doing in your job day to day. There's what you're doing with your kids. There's uh, how you manage things in your own life, your exercise, getting outdoors, meditating, getting enough sleep, reading and learning, whatever. You've got all of that. And all these different elements are contributing to this why, or maybe they're not all contributing, but they're definitely influencing this why. How do you manage that balance? I think I touched on it before. That's the daily the daily challenge, right? I Look, I manage it by routine. Like I'm very, it's actually something that I'm trying to work on. And like we might have had a conversation about this previously, but I'm very routine and ritual, like habituated. Like I'm very big on, we can say it another way, I'm very attached to my routines <laughs> because I just think they serve me. If I wake up at a certain time, I you know, walk, walk, meditate or breathe, walk the dog, do some exercise, you know, have a shower, have a coffee, make breakfast, make lunches, make... You know, like that weekly routine or that daily routine is a really big part of how I get that balance. I was very big on like separating my routine on weekdays versus weekends. And I think I saw you post something on LinkedIn last week about Monday to Friday being or the weekend being 29% of your week. So I'm getting a lot better at getting that consistency through the seven days, which is, I think, really important and not yeah, not getting as fixated on whether it's a weekend or, or not a weekend, but having like a really solid routine is the only way that I can kind of juggle all those things. And then the other thing is, is that in the ideal word world is doing some of those things together with, you know, especially with my kids, you know, or with my wife, with Phoebe. So whether it's walking with her or, you know, we have a cool app called Smiling Minds, which kids use. Um, it's like basically a meditation app for kids, which is you know introduced through um, through the New South Wales public school system. So whether it's just doing you know, two or three little med- uh, you know five minute meditations with with the kids, I mean, like getting those combining them is like the, is the optimal for me. So if I can get tick one of those boxes and you know do it with my family or yeah you know, or pass something on to my kids, then to me that's the perfect day. If I could, if I could say even though there's no such thing as perfect, but that's what I, that's what I'm hunting for. But r- I think routine and ritual is for me a massive part of how I um of how I try and juggle all those things. And sleep is always loses out. <laughs> so that's what I was going to ask you, right? Like, what happens when, like, you're you're an engineer, a structural engineer, uh, or civil? Can't remember. Yep. Um, but whenever you're whenever you're creating something, you it doesn't matter how strong you make it, you can still have acts of God which are just going to destroy it. And sometimes the stronger there was this there was this story. You'll probably not. You'll probably say it better. 
Uh, but there was this story of a bridge where they decided to make the bridge as strong as possible, rigid. And I think it was in the US somewhere. And they have these crazy winds which go through there. And then the whole bridge would start like bending. Yeah, it had like a resonant frequency or something. And then the wind created a frequency of the structure and it just, just completely tore apart. Did they, did they manage to recreate it and fix it? They managed to fix it, but they, they managed to figure out like the, the frequency of the structure is, is something that you can calculate and design. I have no idea how to do it. So don't ask me, but, um, but yeah, it is a genuine thing. And yeah, they, they did figure it out and they, they did make sure that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure like, where were you going with that? Well, I was going to say, it doesn't matter how much structure or routine that you have. Uh, there's still external forces which are going to make it render it useless. Yes. Yep. But then the way that you just just described the solution to that brings us right back to what you said in the first five minutes, uh, which is you just got to find a better way to do it next time. Yeah, just get a little bit better every day. And for me, a really big part of that now is I feel like I'm getting. You know, life, I guess, goes in cycles. So, you know, when you see kids are toddlers or babies and then they're school age, so there's there's different rhythms to those cycles. So I, I sort of feel like I'm getting into a, a pretty good rhythm at the moment with with my work and with just generally family life. Um, but the thing that I'm, yeah, and again, like this is something that we've spoken about before, is the thing that I'm really working on now is, again, just not getting too hung up on hitting that routine and ritual and becoming a little bit more comfortable with responding. Yeah. If it's a weekend and I'm away traveling and I can't do something that I would normally do is not letting that cascade down through the rest of my day is just letting that be a, Oh, well, you know, that's okay. We'll do that tomorrow and just move on and, and make the most of it. And I think that's like a big trap that I would always fall down is that you hit one bump and then you just like the rest of it would just go. So is it as simple for you as just saying, yeah, that one's, I've, I've lost that one, but um, but that's fine. That's just one out of 50 things I'm aiming for to do, or yeah. aiming to do today. But I wouldn't call it simple. It's like one of the hardest things that I find to do. It's, yeah, it's for me, I find it really difficult because I am really routine and routine based yeah and so how do you main remain uh, maintain flexibility in changing what that routine is when when your environment and the external factors require it in the past i would you hit a bump on you know let's say like you can't there's no gym so you can't go to the gym Mm -hmm. right i'm making that up because i don't go to the gym but there there are lots of people impacted by that so you like so it's not so then like most people oh well like you know so before I'd go, oh, well, you know, geez, well, my day is shit now. So I'll have a two bacon and egg rolls and I'll have a big coffee instead of a small coffee. And then, you know, I won't go for a walk at lunchtime. And then, and you, you just kind of like, it almost like slips you up. And, you know, for me, like I'm working really hard on not letting it, not letting it cascade. Cause I find that like, if you let your day cascade, then that has the knock-on effect to the next day, mm-hmm. right? Because like the way you start your day is c- completely correlated with how you ended your previous day. We've been we've been considering KPIs for a lot of our staff, and we've been trying to work out how we do it. But um, a big consideration we're making is that well, we want there to be consistent results. So surely, uh, any bonus or any financial remuneration or reward as a result of achieving these particular incentives should be based on consistency. So we should be looking at the average over the last month, but then that, that might produce the complete opposite results. Cause if they just stuff up in the first week of that month, then they'll be like, Oh, okay, whatever the whole month's gone. Yeah. This is going to be too hard. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you wipe it off and yeah. Yep. And so how do you handle that? Like whether that's in work or parenting or just your own personal life? In terms of like just that maintaining consistency. Yeah. Do you make it like for yourself, at least, at least the psychological rewards that you're giving yourself uh, or the kudos that you like all the times that you pat yourself on the back going, yeah, cool. I did that. 
yeah. you just go, yeah, I'm assigning it to that specific task on that specific day. And if I miss it, okay, I can give myself kudos for that day. But I give myself double kudos for the next day for getting back into it. Yeah. Well, I guess it's the opposite for me now. If I if I miss something or something happens or, you know, there's a crisis at work and I you know, miss lunch or let's say like just something that just doesn't go as well as I wanted to do. If I can get it back on track, I actually give myself more kudos. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, okay. Right. Well, you, you pulled that back on track. Yeah, good on you. Like, there. Yeah, so, but I like, I went through a really couple of really detailed times where I was just taking a diary of my day, like every single, not, not every single thing that I did, but like when I ate, when I slept, what I ate, when I exercised, how long I slept, how long I exercised for whether I meditated or not, whether I had a cold shower or didn't have a cold shower, like all of those things. And I would just like write it all down. And I did, I did two stints for about like two and a half or three months. And it was just so formative. I just like figured out so much about, um, you know, what I do well and what I do really poorly. Um, and so I leaned back on that a lot. As but well, how you were I, in your late thirties might be different to how you are in your early forties, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, it's probably something that I should do all the time, but it also like takes up a lot of time. <laughs> which takes you <laughs> but, away from everything else and the million yeah. things which are pulling you aside. But yeah, so so I, I relied a lot on that as well, of just like a like a really honest, you know, no bullshit diary, which you might be surprised. I don't know if you've done it before, but it's really hard. Cause you yeah. go, you know, I went to the pub and you're like, you literally, you're going, right. I had two beers. <laughs> and like, you know, you had three beers and a red wine and, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, and then a cocktail before you left, but you literally, you find yourself typing oh, two beers, just <laughs> for, like for no reason other than you're just trying to trick yourself. Like, um, like playing golf and on your own and just, oh, exactly. You get a yeah. Hole in one. That's a really good, yeah. Or just kicking the ball out of the bunker and then hitting it, hitting it off the grass. It's yeah. It's <laughs> it's. So if you've never done it, I'd I highly recommend it. It's very eye opening. Okay. It's, no, I went through about a six month period a few years ago. This conversation is reminding me to do it again. And uh, in it, I wrote down how much sleep I got, and then what the different metrics are of how I started the day whether I did meditation or visualization or cold shower or whatever it was, uh, exercise, was it cardio exercise or was it weight based? If it was cardio, was it intense or was it a uh, kind of long, slow distance run? Uh, what was it? What type of exercise was I doing? What did I have for breakfast? Did I have breakfast? Did I eat before or after exercise? All of it. And I, I, yep. I journaled it, uh, in a, in a spreadsheet. And then I realized it was going to take a long time to try and process it. So I'm like, well, the longer I go, then the less press, the more time it's going to take to process this. Maybe I'll just stop now and spend the time on processing it instead of continuing to journal. And I got some really cool insights from it, but then I never put the time back into journal again because it just didn't feel relevant. But no, and I sort of, I think I got the same feeling that it was useful for me to like, I guess as a, just a really honest, like self-reflection of mm. how you're actually living your life and, and what are the things you, that you're doing that serve you. It was, for me, it was really, um, really helpful. And actually one of the biggest things that I got out of it was that, cause I was, I got into a really good ritual ritual of doing daily affirmations, mm -hmm. which sounds again, like, it sounds like really woo woo, but it wasn't like I was standing in front of the mirror, like screaming at myself. Like most of the time I would just like say them to myself in the shower. Mm -hmm. right just like just in my head and uh, to me like that was one of the things that I, and i've actually stopped doing it and like now we talk about it I'm, i i need to get back and do it but that was a really big a really big trigger for me of like how well my day went it's just starting the day with the right mindset i feel like this is relevant for any any change that someone's trying to make anything that they're trying to do i've had i've had clients in the past who really wanted to work on their money mindset and in order to do that, they needed more money awareness. And in order to gain that, I just said, every single time that you're about to spend money, every single time before you spend, I don't care if you're tapping your phone or using a credit card or paying with cash. And I don't care if there's a long queue behind you. Before you buy that coffee or before you buy that item of clothing, take out this particular spreadsheet or Google Sheet or whatever on your phone and type in what are you buying and how much is it going to cost? And then another column of 
how great you think it will make you feel. And then a week later, go back and say, how great did it really make you feel? <laughs> That's a really good idea. And to get people to do that for every single expense, both online, their electricity, the utilities or whatever, or their mortgage repayments or their coffee. Like, it doesn't matter. For every expense. Yeah. But but I think like I mean for me that's why like I get the privilege of like watching what you do from a distance to a certain extent and like I've just got so much respect of what you try and do with people because like unraveling people's relationship with money is just the most complicated thing like it's just you know so people have so many huge convoluted stories and backgrounds and history like with respect to money and how it makes them feel and how it doesn't make them feel and and how they do with it so like every day when i see what you do and i see what you post and i just i I envy you but i also i don't envy you at all have you have you tried doing that with people with regards to their parents and their relationship with their no yeah no relationship with money no that's i find it much easier to give people career advice on on accounting i (laughs) guess far less complicated and i'll leave it to professionals like yourself to to delve into those more complicated realms so have you ever had a chat with someone that you're mentoring and you're like man you need you need some other help you need some coaching or you need psychiatry or psychology whatever you need something more than what you than what you can get from me oh yeah i think like every single time there's, there's not you know i just yeah, you know, i don't have a lot to offer i don't think when i i guess that's how i approach it if i'm mentoring someone or helping them with their career i don't have a lot to actually offer them all i have is i think what i try and do is just be a bit of a mirror and just reflect back to them what i see and what they're projecting to me because like i said most of those times those conversations about the why you know why you want to do what you're doing or why you don't like what you're doing at the moment or why you want to move in a different direction. A lot of those whys that like I was mentioning before end up being, you know, kind of like really complicated. And so like, I was like, it's not my position to try and help people unravel their relationship with their father or like whatever. I just see it as my role is to try and help them realize that that's what's, that's what's blocking them, I guess, to a certain extent, or that's what they need to, to get their head around or that's what they just need to move past before they kind of make an intentional decision about where they go with their, with their career and, and their profession. Yeah. So I don't feel like I need to be like a psychologist or anything. <laughs> I've got a, enough of my own hangups to then to try and <laughs> even think that I can fix other people's. Yeah. So I just see it as one of, no, it's not my superpower, but I think it's something that I've been able to help people with over the years is just to help them realize that maybe there's something a little bit deeper underneath the reasons why they're doing things or not doing things and just helping them lean into those things, you know, you know, and help them make them feel supported, I guess, and a bit less exposed and less vulnerable, you know, cause you just share your own experiences and you know, that, I mean, people know that they're not alone. It makes it, you know, when, you, when you think you're the only person going through something, it's just so horrible <laughs> when you realize that, oh, there's 50 people in the room and they're all going through exactly the same thing or something similar. It just makes it a little bit less, seem a little less daunting straight back to the leading by example so yeah so yeah no i've got nothing for you mate sorry (laughs) (laughs) you say you don't have a lot to offer you don't have anything to give it sounds like you give a lot of humility at the very least and then a lot of presence and mindfulness i do my best and so tell me a little bit more about how you're working so hard to achieve all this stuff you obviously you went from your engineering you decide that's not where you want to go you got to, you went across to accounting and finance and you eventually, like you climbed up pretty high in Lindley's and you eventually decided that's not where I want to stay. What made you decide to move? To be honest, and I think I'm happy sharing this story because I've probably told, yeah, it's because of my career change, I essentially looked around at my peers Mm-hmm. And I guess yeah, when you get to the, a certain point in your career, it becomes, it's the tip of the pyramid, right? Mm-hmm. There's not 50 executive roles. There's only three. Um, and the pool below that I was in, so let's say there was 20 of my peers in, a, in, in Australia, 19 of them had been an accountant their whole career. So let's say 15 or even more, maybe 20 years. 
and most of them had been at Lendlease for the whole of their career. And I was this sort of, well, I'd only just been an accountant or just made the, the professional change. And I just felt like if I wanted to make a positive step, like I guess to make the next step, then it was going to be a very long wait for me to sit in that pool. And I guess I, that was the, when, you know, when an opportunity came for me to move, you know, within the property sector and to another property company. But then I guess at that, at that next step, at the next senior role, it was something that I guess I just leaned into, even though like I say, it was pretty, pretty scary at the time going across there. So it was really just an acknowledgement that there was, you know, I was in a big ocean or maybe the ocean was getting smaller and the fish around me were were pretty big and I need, and I think because I had a unique skill set as well, I had that engineering project management piece and I had the construction finance piece. So I guess what I was looking for was going somewhere where they would value that. Um, so somewhere where they wanted and needed and valued that skill set. And then also on the flip side, somewhere where I felt like I could add value, somewhere where I could use those skill sets, you know, to the advantage of the of the business that I was going into. So was um, that one of the first times where you really made that decision out of out of going towards what you want and yep, doing what's right? Hundred percent. Not yep. doing what you regret. Yeah, absolutely. I'll never forget it. It was just it was just it was such a big thing for me because I like I had to buy a suit. Cause, you know, I'd worked in a construction company for 15 years. I, like, I'd never worn a suit. So I had to, you know, I had to go and buy a suit. I had to dress differently. I had to, I'd never done, I hadn't done a, a resume for, <laughs> for 15 years. I had to do a resume. I had to, you know, find people to be my references. And all of that was like really daunting for me because I just had not done it before. And I know that sounds quite silly, but, <laughs> you know, if you've never had to, my job interview to get my job out of university, I really had, you know, between my third and my fourth year. And then once I was in the cadet program, I never really had to do another job interview again. So that was yeah, hundred percent the first time where I really saw something that was scared the living bejesus out of me. <laughs> and, but I knew I was moving for the right reasons or I knew I was moving towards it for the right reasons and I did it anyway. And that was, yeah, and maybe it's luck that it turned out and it worked well. Um, you know, there's always that selection bias in life, but yeah, it was definitely the first time that I intentionally kind of made that decision. Was this before or after Lily was born? No, that was before. Before. Yeah, okay. So the next big decision was Lily? I did, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. No, I think for me, like probably deciding to get married was like, you know, choosing a life partner, I mm -hmm. think is a bigger decision because it, you know, I think all of that like that's the foundation for everything that comes after that really so yeah obviously deciding to have kids was a big decision but i probably think choosing a life partner was probably a big one so what role has phoebe had in your life oh like incredible like it's i can only i'm only I'm, like i'm here at you know at all hours talking to you because she's at home you know doing all the things that i'm supposed to be doing at home so like i, I couldn't there's no i could not there's nothing that I could achieve or that I have achieved or been able to do that, that hasn't, she hasn't been a massive part of, you know, since university, as you, you can see, I'm kind of, I don't really have the words to describe it other than that. Yeah. And that, that's beautiful to, to see how much you're struggling to describe something that's so important to you. Yeah. yeah it's hard well, to we just had our 20 year anniversary last weekend. So wow. it's been a big, big milestone for two very young people. You keep calling yourself young and then oh, all at the same well, time. All these dualities, man. I'm hanging on to it. I'm hanging on to it. <laughs> young relative, right? Take was it take kindly the counsel of years, gracefully surrendering surrendering the things of youth. Okay. I remind myself of that every single day. <laughs> <laughs> so then you made another massive decision. You you left that other construction firm or the other property firm. Yep. And you went to travel for four months. What inspired that? Mostly, I think the probably the fear of regret was a big was a big part of that, of just you know knowing that there was this window of time where you know our Lily, who was just before school age, you know wasn't in school yet, so we had that freedom and availability to to be a bit more flexible. 
and just that knowing what the potential of what could be without um and knowing that we like i think we we both knew that if we didn't take the opportunity we would have regretted it um so that was a big part just the fear of regret was a big was a big driver in that was that just then, is this fear of regret just is that coming back to your intuition saying this is this would it would be the it's the right thing to do yeah and it would be wrong to not do it yeah and it was yeah and again like it was for all the right reasons it was like um, spending time together as a family, you know, you know, having travel into some areas or just some parts that I'd never you know, been able to or been lucky enough to travel. Doesn't it seem strange now to talk about traveling around the world? <laughs> it's very bizarre. Yeah, but I think it was just a very much an intuitive, it feels right, we're just going to lean into it. And it was very much like just let's just book the tickets there, book the tickets back, and then let's, you know, build a build a structure around the trip as we as we went along but it was just absolutely about you know prioritizing prioritizing family and just taking the opportunity because you know we, we're very conscious that as you know school you start getting into schools and you know school holidays and you know all of those you, you get, become a lot more constrained i guess was was our feeling and it kind of turns out that was right. <laughs> and I guess that's part of why you didn't, you came back, you didn't go back into corporate straight away. You just started doing your own consulting thing. Yeah, it, that was a big part of it because I just really enjoyed that flexibility to be able to, to pick and choose um, to a certain extent, you know, how much I was going to work. But the other thing that I really enjoyed about it was also picking and choosing who I worked with. Because I think as when I, changed i guess when i changed made that big change in my first um career i was really because of the uniqueness of my skill set i really had to hunt for a job i guess or for that next role where i felt like I, like i was saying before where i felt like i added value mm -hmm. so i was really looking for a fit where i could use my skill set and really be of benefit to the business and like that and, and so i took that mindset out into then consulting and running my own business in that I only want to work with people where I feel like I'm adding value. And that was like, you might have a similar experience of, of your career transition, but it was just awakening. I can't describe it any other way. Just completely awakening of going to work every single day and thinking about how you can add value to someone and questioning whether you're adding value and then if you're not making the decision not to turn up and to be brave enough to say, look, I don't need to be here because you know, you're paying me X amount and you're just not, not getting your money's worth. And I don't, maybe you can put it in better words, but for me, it was just so eye opening to just to go to work every day and think differently. It's, it, was, it was transformational for me. And now, and I've been an employee now, you know, where I work for three years and I, kind of feel myself slipping back into that employee mindset to a certain extent, but I can still also pull myself back into to thinking, thinking more like from that value lens rather than from a, I guess maybe from an employee lens. So that was really, I, like I just, yeah, I look back on that time so fondly, just literally because if I just on that realization alone, I mean, um, you're in a you're in a much more senior role, and a lot of people who are aspiring towards, say, CFO role, for example, um, or C-suite exec, whatever, would be thinking that they're going to have so much more autonomy. They're going to be able to do things that they want. They're going to have more agency in their own life, in their career decisions, and what what's happening at work. Are you experiencing that, or are you experiencing what some others have spoken about of like this this greater burden of this greater responsibility you get both <laughs> you certainly get more autonomy to decide what are the priorities and what are the the focus areas that you believe will be the best for the business in the long term but at the same time there's a huge amount of responsibility and accountability that goes with that and so so to a certain extent they like they you, you do get both but yeah with that autonomy also comes a huge amount of accountability and like that said i mean anyone who works for a bigger business 
Like you have to be. It doesn't matter. I don't think it doesn't matter whether you're a chairman or chairwoman or CEO or CFO or CIO or company secretary or vice president or whatever you call yourself. Like you can't do it on your own. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the equivalent of like a rugby team thinking that the like the five eighth of the front rower was the reason that the game was won or lost. No, no one. And there's a lot of probably a lot of big prominent organisations who have maybe have you know marquee CEOs whose kind of brand is attached to the business. If that make you can probably think of some companies that. You know, who's the CEO is basically the company. Yeah, you know, Steve so Jobs. Steve Jobs, General Electric, Lightning Jack. Like there's all these, you know, corporate stories that run around, but like none of those guys and girls do their job in on their own. Like it's a huge amount of cooperation and collaboration. And, and so I think anyone who thinks that they're going to get to a CEO or a CFO or a C-suite job and then they're going to be the masters of the universe and set all the strategy and decide what they're going to do. It's just not the case. Um, if anything, you spend more time listening and more time engaging with people than you do in, in, than I have in any other role. Otherwise, you can't be successful. You can't be successful if you don't know what you're... Like your team and your people know way more about your business than you can ever imagine. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that autonomy is maybe a bit of an illusion or a bit of a fallacy. Yeah. I mean, when I think about it in, in the business that we're running, where our team's growing, we've got seven of us plus another contractor who's almost well, part-time, but pretty much does full-time work. Cool. Um, Congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks. And we've got about six other contractors who we engage with ad hoc for various things, but pretty regular stuff, whether it's website maintenance or personality typing and those sorts of things. And I, I struggle to imagine how I'm going <laughs> to keep, keep hold of the business when I'm not doing the majority of the client-facing work. But yeah, there's, there's so much of this, this culture that we've created because of how purpose-driven we are, exactly is what you're talking about, right? We've got our purpose as our leaders and what we're trying to do, but also, like I left Westpac because I don't want to sell products. Which is, mm. I mean, I left before the Royal Commission. That's exactly what the Royal Commission was about. Uh, I'm not going to name any particular names within the organization, but there were there were definitely people who were senior to me and encouraging me to do things that just didn't feel aligned. I just didn't care anymore. Like I cared so much more about not like not doing the wrong thing than than I did about my financial security. It wasn't. Yeah. Like, it was just it was just a no brainer, and I'm very grateful that I took that leap. I think you've got a similar mindset of like, if you're not adding value to someone or you're not helping them, then you just move on. Right. So how, how do you maintain that? Like how are you maintaining that? You're, you're what, three, three and a half years into back into employee and you, you shared just before you're slipping back into the employee mindset. Yeah. Uh, but you also shared how important this, this perspective is. Um, so you're saying, how do I, how do I not slip back or how do I pull myself out of How that? do you maintain this perspective of I've got to get better every day and a big part of getting better from the way you described it is am I adding enough value? I, yeah, I don't, I actually don't know, have an answer to that. I just, I'd say something really trite like I'd just do it, you know, <laughs> which would be something like, you know, me asking you, you know, how did you give up coffee? And you'd be like, well, I just gave it up. Look, I just always constantly remind myself just that that's what I'm here to do. I'm not here to be an employee. I'm here. It's it's a mindset. I just try and kind of turn it on right now. I need to think about this from a value lens. Are we like, is this something that's going to create value? Is this something that's worthwhile doing? Or does, is, does this feel maybe kind of going back to intuition a little bit as well? Or does this just feel like we're going through the motions? Like what's the reason that we're here doing? What are, what are we having the meeting for? What are we, what project are we working on? Why are we, why are we all sitting in a room focusing on this? Does it align with our strategy? I think you're yeah, having a clear, yeah, as a business leader or someone senior in the business, having a very clear idea of your strategy is really important. Because it allows you to, because if you've sat down, thought about your strategy, you've got it on a page, you know, 
you've taken all the information you can in, you're heading in a direction. It just makes it really, and that's the direction you think is going to be the best long term for you know for sustainable value and, and growth for the shareholders. And then, if that's clear on your mind, then everything else becomes really easy. And I am kind of conscious that that's just circled straight back to the whole <laughs> have a purpose and know where you're going, and then and then the steps just emerge out in front of you, which I know sounds a little bit too simple when you say it out loud, but yeah, I think that's. That's probably how I, how I try and do it at work. So, no, and then all the little things like, say, like daily affirmations and, and all those little kind of rituals that I have that try and remind me of those things. So is that, is that kind of the framework you use with, I guess, every entity that you're involved with? Yourself, I, <laughs> your family, work, everything. That there's a flagpole, you've got to move towards that flagpole, which you see. And it's flexible the way you get there. You've got to have an idea of what the next flagpole is going to be, but you don't need to be that clear of it. But you've got to move towards a flagpole and you've got to keep that momentum. And that yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a pretty strong philosophy for me in terms of how I approach things, whether, it's, whether I'm mentoring someone, whether it's you know, I'm doing something with, with my family, whether I'm working you know, for a not-for-profit and helping them out or you know, even like in sport and or you know or activity and exercise i think yeah it's a pretty common theme for me i'll let you know how it works out <laughs> i mean what what made you decide to move from to move from being self-employed and doing your thing and working with the people you want to work with to go back to employee i actually had the and i was going to say something to you just previously um it was a really interesting piece of advice that i got when I, w I told someone who, uh, I guess, a mentor of mine, S shout out to Schooner, who's, uh, that's his name, Schooner, who I was telling him about, you know, how I've got this great business and everything's going really well and I'm really enjoying it. And it's, and he's like, uh, mate, you don't have a business. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Like, I'm working for myself and I've got an ABN and I'm invoicing people. I'm like, yeah, I've got a business. And he's like, no, you don't. Like, you're just a, like, you just, getting paid for the time that you spend, you're an employee. And I'm like, ah, right, because a business is not just working for yourself. A business is like you touched on before. It's a group of people coming together with a common purpose, working as a collective. And so when, when I made that realization that, oh, actually, no, I'm not actually running a business. I'm really just working for myself as an employee. It kind of made me again like just a bit of an eye-opening moment like oh okay yeah i've probably got a bit more to learn maybe i should uh put the put my boots on and um and dive back in and see where that takes me and i was i'm really grateful for that advice and i'm i'm really glad that i did that because i've just learned so much in the in the last you know two or three years here at bill corp it's just been yeah it's been a, it's been a ride I think, I think the older you get, the more you realize how little you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what's the difference, right? Because you went from, I know you just touched on learning, and I'm, I'm curious if, that's, if that was the actual intention or if that was the selection bias that you referenced earlier. But you, you've taken, like you, you realized that you didn't run a business, that like you didn't own a business, you owned a job, and you were an employee, not a business owner, or you were both, but that kind of just makes you an employee yeah but you went from employee to employee hmm. like what what like you were an employee loving what you were doing and earning enough and moving towards financial freedom or at least mm -hmm. financial independence like why not continue doing that doing what you're loving and having the flexibility and being the dad at home and also having the finances to support and everything kind of working out why not stay there I Oh, uh, like, because like that conversation in on its own, it, it was a really pivotal conversation for me. It just made me realize how little I actually knew about the things that I thought I understood. Okay. <laughs> it was just like, right. I'm, and that was a really right, right. I've got to, I really have to, to, you know, to dive back into this because like, geez, I've just realized I've got quite a bit to learn about, you know, what it takes to run a business. And I... And I guess probably at that time, you know, the 10 year flag on the hill was probably, all right, I want to run my own successful business, which is probably, I think like if you, like if I did my little chart now, that would probably still be, you know, three years later, that's still probably like, that would be my 10 year goal. 
but I, like I feel a little bit like that starting to shift because again I just constantly find myself every day learning more and more about about the complexities of, of, of running of running a really big business and and we sort of touched on it before how difficult it is to be a great leader uh, in a biz- in a big business and I'm really fortunate to work with some incredible people here um, at Bill Corp. And they so say it's just it's humbling, <laughs> humbling for the ego to figure out um, uh, how much you've still got to learn. And I think working for myself, I definitely would have gone. Um, I don't think it would be expansive. It would have been. I would have just stagnated. Maybe not stagnated, but I think I, there was just more potential and more things that I could see that I wanted to tap into. So it was a very. It was a very. I was surprised how easy it was the decision. To, to move back into into a, into a full time employee role. Back to your framework, it kind of sounds like you're like, well, look, if I do this, if I do this now, then tomorrow I'm going to be better. Tomorrow being abstract, right? Tomorrow could be yep. like literally the next day, or another year later, or five years later, I'm going to be better. Yeah, and and, so we're, and back to I think something I spoke about before, which is my other just key thing I always go back to is that is that will this create more opportunities for me in the future? And if the answer is yes to those two, then then it's then it yeah, becomes a no brainer. Yeah. Will it? Will this make me? Will I become better? And will this present more opportunities? Opportunities for me. Yep. Is that with every decision, no matter how big or small? Ah, uh, no, I I don't. No, you'd be surprised how little I think about a lot of things that I do. <laughs> <laughs> but for the big, it just I think for the big decisions, I feel like it served me really well. So yeah, I know, I know it sounds a little bit simple and a little bit trite, but yeah, keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Got it. Simple, stupid. So, what's your what's your new ten year flag? You mentioned what your seven year was, but I think it's still. I'd like to. I think in ten years' time, I'd like to be running my own business. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I'm sort of. I, I was used to hold onto that quite tightly, and now I'm not so sure because I I'm not quite sure. There's a lot, you know, no one becomes, you know, what's the, the saying that it takes you 20 years to become an overnight success. And I just feel like, especially when I get the opportunity to work with great people, that I feel like I get a lot out of that. It, it Like it fuels me, I guess, to a certain extent. So I'm a little bit less attached to that going off and starting my own business and building something from scratch and a little bit more interested now in how I might navigate my career in a way that helps me um, continue to grow, I guess, like in, in the way that I feel like I've been lucky enough to in the last, you know, two or three years. Um, yeah. So whether that's staying in, in a role, yeah, like, you know, like I am now and um, as I get more and more comfortable and competent, I think competence is probably the, the more appropriate word as I get more competent in in that role, um, doing a little bit more, um, you know, not-for-profit work or, you know, doing some governance and advisory work with, you know, in that sort of space. I think that's, I'm, I'm probably leaning towards that as a, as a bit of a flag on the hill. If I can, you know, really master what I'm doing and free up a bit of bandwidth for me to be able to give back a little bit, you know, in a not-for-profit sense, I guess. That's probably, they're the two flags that I'm jostling with at the moment. This is, and we'll, we'll touch on that. We'll, we'll, I'm definitely going to dive into that impact piece in a moment. Uh, but this sounds like such a consistent theme in your life, especially especially in your, especially since you kind of finished uni, but probably even why you ended up going to the big city to go to uni in the first place is it just sounds like there's this whole thing of the people you surround yourself with is so important. The fact that you've got to leave a town of eight or 900 people because the people you surround yourself with could just be more incredible. You've got to leave engineering because the people that you can surround yourself with over there are going to be far more potent on you. And you don't want to be like the people that you see around you with divorce and drinking and swearing all the time or whatever. And <laughs> like you, you've spoken about the same thing with Phoebe and even with your girls. And like everything that you've done, including going and doing your own thing and then realizing, hey, actually, I want, I want more of that being around amazing people. Hmm. And even that was inspired by a conversation with a mentor of yours who 
is you're being around another amazing person. Kind of just sounds like the the common theme. Yeah, I'd I'd never really reflected that, but it probably uh, it was probably about I think about ten years ago, or no, it was probably even longer. It was quite early in my career that like I really I think I, it was a little bit of mentoring from a um, you know from I guess a manager, and then also just something that I noticed that good people were always like they always congregated, if that made sense. Mm-hmm. Like they were always like, there'd always like be pockets in any organization or project or business where just like really high quality people hung out. And it, whether that was coincidence or not, I always, I guess, have just figured out that, you know, you're just like, a, what's the saying? Like you're just the sum of the, like the five people that you spend the most time with or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's so true. Like you, we are 100% animals of our environment. Um, and if you s- surround yourself with shit people, then like, it's really hard not to be a shit person. Like it's not impossible, but like it's really difficult. And on the flip side of that, if you can, if you can find really impressive people and just learn from them, then like what a great way to live. And like, I was really, I think you got me onto it. I was, I was really, like it's really resonated with me and stayed with me the book um, Art of Learning mm-hmm. by Josh. Waitkin. Yeah, wait, right. and I think that's just like if you have a, a, a learning mentality through your life, it's just it just sets you up for success in so many ways. Yeah, so I'd n- not really thought about that, I guess, macro pattern, but I think you're right. It's... Like, I really do believe that you are who you associate with. I mean, it's not, I, I believe that. It's not, it's not coincidence that I keep wanting to spend more time with you and have you in my life. It's, <laughs> there's no coincidence for it. Very flattered. No, but you know what I mean? It's like, and like people who are poisonous, like family members and things like that. It's just, like, I'm very fortunate. I love all my family members and I get along with them great. At, but you just see people who've got family members and they're not, they're just so destructive to their life and you just want to shake them and say, just like, move on. Um, mm. But you don't want to, it's kind of hard because you see people run away from those situations. And I think it's important how you like deflect those people. I don't, I don't know if deflect's the right word, but I think it's important not to just run away and ignore them and pretend that they never existed in your life. But I also think it's really important to get them out of your life. And like, maybe, I don't know, we can pull apart that contradiction a little bit, but yeah, it's just, you just see some people that are just completely poisoned by one bad person in their life. Um, and you see it when people get, um, get divorced and they, you know, I saw a friend the other day who's, you know, I didn't realize was separated from his wife. And before he told me that he was separated from his wife, I was like, mate, you look amazing. Like. What have you been like have you been working out and have you been and he's like yeah i guess i've been to the gym a bit more and i've been doing all these things and then um you know half an hour later i find out that he's been separated from his from his wife for you know for eight or ten weeks or something I think just a perfect example of how you how uh the flip side of that of that having someone who's dragging you down or bringing you down it's just got to move away from it i'm reminded of this uh of someone of someone I know quite well, and I saw a coaching intervention that they had. And they were having a lot of challenges with their parents, a lot of pretty significant challenges. And their parents were very demanding, controlling, and very frustrating. And they were asked, are you able to meet, like, what, what, are, your, what are your parents' needs? Said what the parents are really desiring. What are your needs? Said what they're really desiring. And then the coach just asked, are you able to meet your parents at this stage right now? Are you able to meet your parents' needs and your own at the same time? And they said, no, I'm not capable of doing that. Okay. So what are you going to do? I'm not going to, not going to keep myself so beholden to meeting their needs at the expense of my own. I'm going to meet my own needs, grow, and then I can re-engage with them. Yeah. Amazing. That's probably one of the best coaching 
interventions I've ever seen ever. And I, and I think that's I think you just said what I was struggling to say because it's not about running away from it, right? It's like you exactly like you said. It's like move away from it, grow, and then lean back into it. And when you you know when you're in a space to do that, or you know, but you know, so don't run away from it like it's something you're afraid of and you're just going to pretend it never existed. Um, so I really like that. That's a like a really good way of, um, of expressing it. And I like how you've said, you've used the term leaning into things to make decisions. And you've said that a few times now. And that's interesting because it, it reminds me of the metaphor of skiing or snowboarding. You never actually turn. Like, well, very rarely do you actually yeah. turn. <laughs> you lean, right? It's always leaning. And I'm finding this with, with everyone who I'm interviewing, whom I hold in high regard of successful, uh, as in they've been able to make great decisions, those decisions have culminated in what we define as success. And with the exception of probably like, you know, one, two, maybe three really big decisions which they've had to make, and those are big turns, right? They're like, no, not doing that anymore, turning, I'm going that way. With the exception of those, Everything's just a lean into it. It's a journey. You got steps along those way along the way. That sound that that looks like a cool direction to go in. I'm going to start leaning towards it. I'm going to see, get a little bit closer, and then lean that way. And I I suspect that this is where growth mindset really comes in. Is this belief that the slope doesn't run out, or at least not in the near future? A lot of people think, oh my god, but if I go that way, then I'm going to get to the bottom faster, and then I'm I'm going to I'm not going to be able to keep skiing and I'm going to have to wait for this. I'm going to wait for the ski lift and I'm going to go up and there might be a blizzard and I'm just going to get stuck in the ski lift for an hour. And it's just, uh, maybe I should just kind of continue going the way I'm going. Cause I think that might allow me to kind of keep going for it a little bit longer, the comfort zone. Right. And what you, what you keep talking about is like, I've, I've never heard you once say, you know what, you're, you're going to have limits and it's only so far you can go. <laughs> you haven't said it once. It's you just keep going and believe that you'll stop when you stop, but there's no point in in fearing that happening. Yeah, and you're right. Like it is, a, it's a subtle different, but it's a like it's a really important way of thinking, I think. And yeah, you know, it's. I mean, I guess the other thing that I've, I think I've seen or observed is that like no one's just jumped in and done something and been an overnight success. You know, like. Or like, or someone, you know, like people I, like, if, you know, someone's asking me, oh, like, I hate my job and I think I want to go and, I don't know, be a ceramicist. Yeah. Like, I'm, you know, like, well, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go and do a course at TAFE and I'm going to do it. And I'm like, just like, like, go and buy a clay disc thing and buy an urn and just do it for a couple of like nights a week and just see if you enjoy it first. <laughs> like it's like, like to make really important changes in your life, it, it doesn't need to be this big transformational moment. It like, it, like I think people maybe because it gets sort of over glamorized in, you know, the way that it's presented, you know, the, that success bias or selection bias or the way that, that stories get told in the media but it's it's way more complicated than that and it's way more subtle. And I think people who've really found their niche and found something that they love, like no one's ever jumped into a job the first day and gone, this is the best job ever. I love it. I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. Or maybe someone has, but I've never met them before. Like it's just a, just a series of like try a job, you don't like it, go and try something else try and keep within your realms of your profession so that you're building a set of skills and a set of tools that are going to be, that are, that are serving you longer term. But there's no like, like perfect answer of just jumping into the perfect job and being happy for the rest of your life. It's just, it's a fallacy. So how do you deal um, with a challenge which presents itself? Like a big challenge that you've had, it's presented itself and you're like, oh crap, how am I going to handle this? Oh, I think you, yeah, well, I've very much got a mentality of like just pony up and just get on with it. So for me, a lot of it's just brute force. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, but I need to, ha but I need to have that clarity of why I'm doing it to to be able to do it. And they, like even if I know that why and it's for the wrong reason, sometimes I'll still push through and do it anyway because. <laughs> 
I think that's just how I'm hardwired. Yeah, but I think just having that clarity of, of, of what you're what you're diving into is just so important. But I guess my point is is that like I just think it's easier to to maneuver into a transition rather than, you know, jump off the end of a wharf. It's, it's just that's not how the world works. Yeah. So I, I'd agree with it. I think most people who have what I would define as a successful life have have lived a life of like navigating their way through it thoughtfully. Um, rather than just like randomly jumping off and doing shit. Although it seems to have worked okay for Elon Musk. But you know. <laughs> I think you he's know. had to navigate quite a few different he's, things. He's <laughs> probably had a good 35 years of navigation before um, before it's got to the point where we see what, what, what he you know, what he's doing. So, so yeah, that, that resonates with me a lot. Yeah. And you touched on impact a few minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. I'm losing track of time. Yeah, you touched on impact and you're, it's even something you're starting to deliberate about. It's like, do I continue down this kind of path where I'm adding value or do I go down another path of where I'm creating more impact? Yeah. And what's going on in your mindset there? How do you define impact? How do you define value? How are you making this decision for yourself? Look, I think that's something that I'm navigating at the moment. I guess where I come from it, or I guess my perspective, is that I feel... I feel very lucky. I feel very privileged. I feel, you know, my lot in life has been pretty cool. You know, just like where I was born, you know, the fact that I was born with two educated parents who could afford to, you know, put a roof on my head and send me to a school and, you know, um, you know, only damage me a little bit, you know, not heaps. <laughs> right. like, to a certain extent, I just like you see, I just feel so privileged. And I think that for whatever reason, I feel like there's, I have an obligation with that privilege to, I'm not talking like, like about male privilege or white privilege or anything. I'm just thinking like, I just feel lucky. And I, and I know that there's so many people out there who just aren't. Yeah, a, safe, a safe like, upbringing with secure attachment. Safe, <laughs> safe upbringing, exactly. Safe upbringing. It's a, it's a really good way of putting it. And um, and so I just feel like again, as I get more competent in what I do, I feel like I have a personal obligation to also contribute back a little bit. Uh, and then you kind of get to right. Well, you know, I've got a certain set of professional skills that I've developed over the years that I think I can. I know that you know, can help you know, a lot of organizations. And then you kind of go, right, well, what organizations do you want to you know, impact? Um, yeah, so for example, like I'm just starting this year with um, CPA Australia, um, doing a role on what they call their divisional council, which is sort of like a, it's a voluntary role where sort of we kind of sit across the top where we represent all of the members of CPA, um, all the CPA members in New South Wales. And it's our job to articulate to the board of CPA Australia through their corporate structure, what the members need and what they um, would like more of, what they would like less of and how can you know that organisation be of greater service to its members. And I'm super thankful for becoming a CPA because it was just like, it was just like, it was hugely impactful for my career. And um, it just gave me a phenomenal, like a completely different lens to think about the world of work and of a business that I was in. So that's something that I'm really like passionate about giving back to because I feel like I've just gotten so much from them. And then after that, look, I'm not sure. Like, I love what sport does. I love the intersection of community and health and activity and, and business and government. I love the way all of that merges in sport. And I love the impact that sport has on, on particularly on kids, but just on communities. So that's probably like another area that I'll, you know, that I'd like to explore a bit more as I, as I, so you can get a bit of spare time, but maybe that's maybe that's part of the the flag on the hill conversation or the the flag on the hill. So they're probably the two areas that where I I you know, I think about you know how can I make an impact and how can I give back a little bit? Mm. How can I be of service? I know that like that sounds a bit trite, and I don't really like that saying, but 
I don't have anything better at the moment. So, well, you, you've touched on it. Even the way you're describing leadership is more of servitude leadership. It's not how can I get other people to do things for me. It's these people know more about the business than I ever will, and how can I be an example to help them be the best that they can be. All right, yeah, we were talking about this today, um, just like just at, like at work with some colleagues about, particularly now with remote working and mm-hmm. and you know hybrid working, like you can't make people do stuff anymore because they're at home, like they're deciding what yes. they're going to do. So you have to be able to articulate why they're doing something and why it's important, because you need. They need to have this self-motivation to sit down at their computer and not take their dog for a walk and not go and get a cup of coffee and not go and pick their kids up from school and not do the thousand other things that you could do at home because it's just a, like they're all delicious distractions. Mm. So it's just you have you can't force, you can't stand over someone's desk when they're working from home and tell them to do something. You just can't. And it puts a huge obligation on managers and leaders to really be able to articulate to the people in their teams why you're asking them to do something that they that they that you need them to do and why is it important. So like COVID has just like super amplified that in a just ridiculous way, and it's something that I think you know I'm certainly kind of grasping with, and I think a lot of people are as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Look, I, I love this, and we're we're getting to the time. It's getting late, so let's let's wrap this up. I'll try and feed back what I've what I've heard from you overall, and you let me know afterwards what you want to add or clarify or anything that you want to share. But you started out by talking about these decisions that you've made is primarily about just choosing your lane. You can't do everything, but you got to go in a direction. You can't just stay where you are because it's comfortable. You got to. Pick something that you're going to be good at, pick a direction and choose a strategy and go for it. And so you even said, right, like you never failed. Right? You've never said this was this was a bad thing because you've never really looked for the path of least resistance or you used to. And then you learned that that's, that wasn't actually uh, giving you a satisfying life. And you, like you've, you shared something which you're which you're trying to instill in your daughters. I find it beautiful. Is saying that there's success in every failure. You just need to find it. And if you can't find it, you're just not looking hard enough. Whatever it is. And then you moved across to this. Well, you mentioned a few times about mentorship, which you've had, and the people that you're around and who you're in close proximity with. And ultimately, you can never do it alone, either as the leader of the business or uh, in the fact of your life and your marriage. There's nothing that you've been able to just do purely alone. And so you've picked the companies you've been in, the colleagues you've been around, the life partner you've chosen, the way that you interact with your kids, because it's not going to be on your own. It's going to be a collaborative effort. Collaborative effort. And so I, I really like this metaphor, which we kind of built together of like this flag on the hill, which your, your 10 year flag on the hill is always going to be something which is really clear. That's what you're moving towards. And you know that you're just going to be navigating through life. You're just going to be leaning into all the decisions you've got as or that you're making as you're moving towards it. But in three years' time, you're not still moving towards that seven-year flag. <laughs> it's not a seven-year flag. It's a 10-year flag, and it might not be there. It might be somewhere else, and it might be something completely different. And so then that's what you're moving towards. And I think that's a big difference between yourself with your growth mindset versus a lot of people who are struggling to have the sense of achievement that you've had and the sense of enjoyment or put the enjoyment aside because uh, happiness is rather fleeting, but joy is something else. But I think that's a big difference. You're, you're not just moving towards something going, well, that's what I'm moving towards. Oh, I can't do that anymore. Oh, well, everything sucks now. Or I achieved it. Okay, I guess I got there. You're always moving forward and you'll say, well, someone might ask you, well, what if that's not the right thing? What if that's not the right direction to go to? And from what you've explained, my guess is that your response is going to be like, so what? I've moved towards something. I've learned something. That's cool. There's somewhere else I want to go. Great. I'll go there. It's better than just standing still, staying where you are and giving up. Couldn't agree more. Did I miss anything? 
No, that's why I love talking to you because I always learn a little bit more about myself every time I do. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best. Yeah, no, and I think like the only caveat that I'd add to that is that I think yeah, where that framework or that mindset doesn't work in like is in, you know, like catastrophic life or death situations, right? So when you when someone's got cancer or, you know, someone gets hit by a bus or whatever, like I've never found a framework that fits those scenarios. But that's kind of one of the reasons that I think all of the other decisions that you make in your career and your profession to a certain extent in your life on a day-to-day basis is it's just like they're just not that material like and everyone makes like really bad decisions all the time so you've just got to find the the best out of them and and take what you can out of it and and keep moving on and there's this classic classic quote i love it it's um it's from a movie i won't say the movie because it'll show how poor my movie taste is but it's like (laughs) Like what, like worrying is just like going backwards and forwards on a rocking chair. Like you just expend so much energy, but you never go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my, yeah, I think the best advice I ever get and the best advice I give out all the time is it's just like, know what you don't want to do and then just move away from it. Like, and if, and that momentum, I think like you, you'll probably know the saying that Tony Robbins has got some saying about like momentum equals I don't know, something else you could probably finish that sentence. Um, but it's just so true. Like momentum matters. Um, and if you, if you know where you don't want to go, it's so important because it just means you can point yourself in, in the opposite direction and then just move towards it. Why would that framework be any different for if you get cancer and you're, or you, someone that you love gets hit by a bus and you're facing the end of that part of your uh, life it, or relationship? Why would it be any different? I, I haven't had like hugely traumatic experiences like that, but I just know from, from the, the, you know, the experiences I have had, but there's just so much chaos involved in those scenarios. It's really hard to, I think it's really hard to think clearly, clearly in those situations. It might be so, hard, but doesn't the same framework apply? Yeah, but that's like you saying it's easy to give up coffee. You just give up coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy. It was making a commitment for 10 days and then see how I'm going. And it was with a whole bunch of other changes as well. And the whole bunch of reasons behind it. And there was all this motivation to be able to do it. Yeah, there you go. And so that, and that's me oversimplifying it, but yeah. So, so yeah, it's, um, yeah. So I, yeah, hopefully I never have to have, have to navigate scenarios like that, but you know, life throws those things at us and, and, um, yeah, once it happens, I'll let you know how we go. Ben, thanks for your time here. This is, there were some nuggets of gold that you were just sharing. And I'm sure that everyone who's listening, or at least most people who are listening, will have been able to really enjoy the conversation and receive a lot of benefit from learning your mindset, your perspective and your journey and how you make these decisions and how you keep moving forward. It's a, it's a beautiful journey. Oh, mate, thank you. I it's like, thank you for doing this and for what you're doing. I love watching it. And, um, like I said before, I love talking to you because I always learn a little bit more about myself every single time. So thank you. I learn more about you every single time. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a win-win, really. A win-win, 100%. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Harry. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Success with Purpose, and I also hope that you feel capable to apply some of the perspectives and learnings from this episode in your own life. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe below. And until next time, live with purpose.